get started. Good morning again, everybody. So happy to have you back here with us on the IRA team at the Truth and Transformation fourth year convening. You don't want to step away because panel two is starting right now and the rest of the day is going to be filled with many meaningful conversations. This one in particular truly um, I think will bring in just incredible knowledge of the scholars and and curators and um, organizers that we have in this space. So this will focus on facing the past. Um, we'll be discussing the role that museums and memorialization can play in racial reckoning and want to thank all of you again for joining and please continue to put those questions in the chat and uh, engage. I'll introduce our first panelist, Salamisha Tillett, who is a scholar, Pulitzer Prize winning writer and activist. Dr. Tillett is the Henry Rutgers Professor of Creative Writing and African American and African Studies at Rutgers University, as well as the director of Express Network, a center for socially engaged art and design at Rutgers. We're also joined by Mary Elliott, who is the curator of American slavery at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. There's a few other nicknames and acronyms, but that's the full title. She co-curated the Museum Slavery and Freedom inaugural exhibition and curated and wrote the special broadsheet section of the award-winning New York Times featured publication, The 1619 Project, which I'm sure many of our viewers have read. Our third panelist is Eduardo Gonzalez Cueva, who is convener at Think Peace Learning and Support Hub. He is a sociologist with 24 years of experience supporting transitional justice processes around the world, including supporting dozens of truth and reconciliation commissions, as well as contributing to the design of criminal justice, reparation, and memorial policies. And last but certainly not least, is Catherine Hall. Dr. Hall is Emeritus Professor of Modern British Social and Cultural History at University College London. Her research focuses on rethinking the relation between Britain and empire in the early and mid 19th century and reflects on the ways in which metropolitan ideas and practices have been shaped by the colonial experience. And finally, I have the immense pleasure of introducing my colleague here at IRA, our senior research fellow leading our global justice work, Dr. Gloria Ie. Dr. Ie works on our IRA team and is also a lecturer at Harvard University. She is a political scientist with deep expertise in race and ethnic politics and transitional justice. Her breadth of research focuses specifically on the work of truth and reconciliation commissions globally. And as a final reminder, you can read much lengthier bios of all of our speakers on the Whova site. Please let me pass the mic to you, Dr. Ie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. And uh, it is wonderful to be with all of you today. And I am just so excited and it's it's an immense honor to moderate this panel with our esteemed guests. So um, I want to begin with a, a general question to our panelists. So we do know that um, memorialization work is a very important form of truth telling, something that we have to in our, our societies and our communities pay attention to and how societies remember their past and the, narrati the narratives that they specifically choose to embrace as part of the collective conscience um, and consciousness will directly affect how they address issues of uh, racial injustice and how they are involved in work to promote equity and try to confront harm for groups that have been marginalized and oppressed. So this question is to, each of our panelists, um, please speak about the importance of memorialization practices and how these efforts can promote civic engagement and shape collective narratives and representations of the past. And a, a second part of the question would be, what memorialization efforts have you been involved with and what have been the primary objectives of your own work? And I'd like to begin um, with um, Dr. Tillett, please. Okay, thank you. Um, and of course, an honor to 
to be here. Um, even though I'm not at Harvard, uh, I went there for grad school, so I always feel at home. Um, and I'm from Boston too, so which is a city of many memorials, um, and probably impacts my own uh, relationship to uh, these questions of civic identity and um, community engagement. Um, I have a quick, uh, quick PowerPoint that you're going to speed through with me, Gloria, because uh, I wanted to kind of answer the second part of the question, like my own um, relationship, my own practice as a way of getting to, to the first part of the question. Um, and so the first slide is uh, it's a project that I worked on from the summer of 2020 uh, up until uh, actually like last week. So um, summer of 2020, I'm based in Newark, New Jersey, um, and the mayor, Raz Baraka, um, uh, enabled, empowered the citizens and just the city itself to remove the Christopher Columbus statue in June of, of 2020, uh, as the world was also changing and really dealing with these monuments. So you can go to the next slide. So these are just images by uh, my sister, who's also a social documentary photographer, Shahrazad Tillett. Next slide. And at that uh, event, there was only, there were two children present and this young girl named Fatina was turning eight years old. This is her eighth birthday uh, celebration. And so Shahrazad asked her after the Columbus statue was removed, uh, will you be my monument? And I remember thinking when she took that image and asked that question, that there's something profound happening in that moment. And Shahrazad has a sustained practice um, on black girlhood in terms of her photography uh, practice. Next slide. So in uh, the fall of 2020, we were given the opportunity to submit a proposal to do a, a mural downtown Newark as part of a larger project there where uh, for buildings that are empty um, are now turned into mural spaces. And so we collaborated with Shahrazad, uh, Chantal Fishang, who's a colleague of mine here at Rutgers, uh, curator Rebecca Jean-Paul and Aaliyah Allen worked on transforming this building into a mural. Next slide. So this is what it looks like before. Next slide. And we had a two part, um, we use the prompt, will you be by monuments and put it in acrylic mirror. Next slide. And then we put this image of Fatina, made it larger than life. Uh, and that's Fatina there in the fall of 2020. Next slide. And Shahrazad, put her. Fatina and her family. Next slide. My children and Fatina's image. Next slide. So then we did a community activation in June, 2020. So we dedicated, so you're going from Christopher Columbus to Fatina to now you're doing a community activation in which we did a kind of festival to black girls in the city of Newark. And that's Fatina with her family. Next slide. And then we invited girl organizations in Newark to restage uh, this idea of being one's own monument in front of this image. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And then we asked everyday people to become monuments themselves. And so we did a 3D scan and we actually uh, gave every person a kind of mini monument of themselves. Next slide. We updated the monument just last month uh, using the fabric from Fatina's um, pants and changing the kind of uh, acrylic mirrors to this uh, mirroring her pants, but then also playing with this idea of the monument. Next slide. And then what's also happened at the same time the Christopher Columbus statue was taken down was this uh, movement in the city to create a Harriet Tubman statue and to rename what was Washington Square, Tubman Square. And so five artists submitted proposals. Next slide. And the artist that was chosen was Nina Cook-John and her piece, Shadow of a Face. Next slide. Oh, it's... And it's a film. So it's a, if you can go back to the last slide and I'll end here. Uh, it's a kind of a, a mix both of um, figurative and kind of conceptual. Uh, and this, this, this piece is one that you're supposed to be able to touch Harriet Tubman's face, but also see this kind of larger than life size abstract um, rendition of her. And so I think through this process, you can see, you know, these questions of what do you do with a monument that's removed? What are the ways in which you can activate a space that's in relationship to that? And then what are the new monuments that could come about as a result? And the last thing I would say is that um, the mural is both kind of a short-term uh, five-year and the, this, this uh, Harriet Tubman is, is supposed to be a long-term monument. So these are questions about uh, time, what's the purpose of a monument, 
and what's the community's relationship to it as a community around it is changing. So I'll end there and I think I'll, you know, this time in Q&A for us to talk a little bit more about it, I guess. Thank you so much, Dr. Tillett. Uh, this is incredible work that you have done. Um, and, oh, thank you. and honestly, to, to think about how individuals can become monuments in, them, in themselves really changes the conversation about remembrance. So thank you again for, for your work on this. I'm, I'm really moved by it. Oh, thank you. All right, uh, next uh, I will pose the same question to Ms. Mary Elliott um, with your extensive work um, curating um, these similar type of projects. Please speak to what you've been doing. Well, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind starting my slide presentation, and I will be moving through it rather quickly. So, um, just let me know whenever you're ready. Sure. Give me one second. No problem. All right. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about slavery, the cultural landscape and um, memory. And this is the National Museum of African American History and Culture where I work. It was opened really, if you think about it, on, on the idea of memory. Um, it was an idea that came about in 1916 by a group of former US colored troop members who wanted to memorialize the, the service of African American men in the military in the nation. The museum opened in 2016, and I want to run through a, a few um, key points before I go into some of my work related to today's topic. The museum looks at the American story through the African American lens. That lens is a lens that looked out onto a, um, a diverse world. We look at this as a shared history, a human story, and part of our vision is that we are a 21st century museum that serves as a model for collaboration, dialogue, and reconciliation. And in thinking about how we approach our curation, we think about how we humanize the story. So how we present diverse perspectives, interracially, economically, regionally, um, even thinking about black people, um, white people, not being monolithic within our own um, different groups as we identify, and then illuminating the story of historically marginalized communities. And then finally also looking at who gets to tell the story, interpretation, and how we use this history to transform the landscape and transform communities. We can go to the next slide. So what I wanna think about today, and I really appreciated Dr. Tillett's presentation is we always think about, um, you know, today particularly monuments that are coming down and what do we replace them with? But the work that I've been doing is working in the landscape with communities that helped us to identify artifacts, to bring those stories into the museum, but that our relationship did not end there. That we looked at the history and the landscape and how to really lift up this history and mark the landscape and actually memorialize the contributions of African-Americans whose history had otherwise been discarded and seen as not significant enough to preserve. What you're looking at is the slave cabin from Edisto Island, South Carolina, which we acquired and is currently placed in the museum. It was built in the 1850s, lived in until the 1980s, and we were able to take it apart piece by piece and conserve the artifact and then ultimately place it in the museum. The image you see of a collective group of people is an image of community members who came out every day for a week and shared their stories, their connections to the cabin. Those community members include members of descendants of the enslaved community and descendants of the enslaving families as well. And then you see this image of two women, Miss Emily Meggett and Isabel Meggett. Miss Emily is the sister-in-law of Isabel Meggett. Isabel Meggett lived in that cabin herself. And so we were really honored to have them at the museum to tell the story about what they knew about the history of the cabin and really about the community. Next slide, please. So again, we don't just stop at collecting artifacts and you can see that we engage in conversations that through these diverse voices, it helps us with the interpretation of the objects we present in the, in the museum. 
but also through our work, we're able to really convene a diverse group of people to reflect on this history and to think about who we were, who we are, and who we want to be, and use this history to prompt um, transformative dialogue, substantive dialogue, and action. So here you see a house from the Reconstruction era. It was built by a gentleman, Jim's, Jim Hutchinson, who it was actually built by his son. He acquired, Jim Hutchinson acquired about 900 acres of land. He distributed amongst um, community members during the period of Reconstruction. He was enslaved, escaped to freedom, and served in the U.S. colored troops. And so he was able to use his, his power as a community leader and as an entrepreneur to acquire land and to help lift the community. This house was falling in disrepair and the Edisto Island Open Land Trust stepped in to save the house and preserve it. And in working with the family members, the descendants of Jim Hutchinson, who are also descendants of the people who lived in the slave cabin and with other community members, they were able to restore the home and to start beginning on interpretation of the home. And so it was a real pleasure to be able to be part of this engagement and help them think through how to approach preserving the home, what it would be used for, how to engage the, the community and how to use it as a site for transformative dialogue down on Edisto Island, thinking about issues of race, about memory, about slavery, the legacies of slavery and about the pursuit of freedom. And so some of the images you see there show the diversity of people who gathered at the, cat, at the Hutchinson house when they cut the ribbon for the Hutchinson house. And then you see one of the descendants of Jim Hutchinson who's out in the community at a local library with a banner exhibition discussing his family's history. Next slide. And then finally, we look at the story of Africatown, the Clotilda, the Clotilda, the last illegal slave ship documented to enter into the United States in 1860. I've had the honor of working with a group called the Slave Rex Project, spearheaded by um, the museum, National Museum of African American History and Culture, George Washington University, National Park Service, and Ezeko Museum in South Africa, and diving with a purpose. We went down to Alabama to identify the remains of the slave ship, which was burned and attempted, there was an attempt to destroy the evidence of this illicit activity. And so we were able to identify the remains of the ship and we're in the process of working with National Geographic and the Alabama Historical Commission to start to raise some artifacts out of the Mobile River to preserve that history and do some truth telling as we say. Um, in addition to that, I worked on community engagement, community dialogue. Here you see images of me um, working with, speaking with elders in the community at local churches, at their homes, and also speaking with the mayor of Mobile about the significance of this history and how it should be preserved and memorialized. Next slide, please. And so today I am so extremely excited to share with you that as of this morning, midnight, Netflix launched the film Descendant, which follows this very important story about the history of the Clotilda, but equally important is the history of Africatown, the community founded by those people who were forced over in the Middle Passage on the Clotilda, who survived five years of enslavement in the United States and went on to found a community in Mobile, Alabama called Africatown, a thriving community that has since been pretty much decimated by environmental injustice, um, industrial encroachment, and how the descendants are fighting to hold on to their community and also to restore the truth of this history and to memorialize it. And so um, I can get into a little bit more about that, but you see the um, image of Kucha Lewis, the gentleman who was one of the 110 who were forced over on the Clotilda. And then there's also an image um, in the far right corner at the bottom of the forthcoming Africatown Heritage House, which will help to preserve and present this history in the community itself. So that's part of what I do. And I can tell you a little bit more as we go into the next session. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Elliott. Uh, I am so excited about the film Descendant. Uh, wow. I think going to be so important for everyone to learn um, this part of U.S. history. And um, a point you made about the transformative nature of dialogue. Uh, 
that is something that we all have to keep in mind as we talk about trying to tell the truth about history and engage in these types of memorialization processes. So thank you again for all the work that you are doing to preserve our full nation's history. Thank you. I will now move on to Mr. Uh, Eduardo Gonzalez. Uh, Eduardo, could you please share with us um, a little bit about the work that you have been doing in this space? In the last two minutes, I have been downloading Descendant, um, Googling, will you be my monument, the Four Corners project. So very busy with that and learning from all of you guys. Um, well, I, I think the question is extremely important. What we are discussing right now concerns uh, what a society decides that it's worth of remembering and more specifically worth to remember with honor. Uh, but when we say that a society decides to remember something, of course, we're, talk we're talking about a society in its given conditions. And that includes, of course, the differentials of power that structure such a society. Uh, that is, a society never decides what to remember in the abstract. It decides what to remember, uh, taking into consideration who has power. And that has to do with, of course, uh, the way in which a national project is structured around categories of class, race, gender, um, ethnicity. And, and so it's never casual. Why is it that the uh, landscape of memory is organized in a way like this? Um, it is not casual at all that um, when you walk in any um, old capital in, in Europe, uh, probably more than half of the monuments that you're going to find are men on horses, right? The, the classic statue of a man on a horseback, it's, uh, of course, the epitome of warrior, military, masculine virtues, and those are linked with uh, very specific national projects. It's not casual also that um, a project called uh, She Built New York uh, counted all the statues uh, dedicated to historical figures in the entire city of New York. And out of 150 statues, it counted 145 dedicated to men and only five dedicated to women, right? Which um, created, of course, an interesting discussion in the city and the um, decision to erect five more. Right, which will be bring the grand total to 10 out of 155. So that's that's how, how progress is measured, I suppose. Um, of course, without going through the uh, civic bureaucratic procedures of uh, Stalin, Stalin and, and uh, taking away statues, societies have been doing that on their own. So in the last few years, we have seen, for example, um, how um, in countries that are based are on a history of slavery and colonialism, uh, social movements have taken down statues. They do just ask for, uh, for taking down certain statues, but have taken down statues. And I am thinking of a very particular example. Of course, all over my region, Latin America, the statues of Christopher Columbus are under siege um, every time that we approach October 12th. And, um, and in many countries, those statues have actually gone down through a combination of um, popular pressure, uh, organized movements demanding that those statues go down and political decisions to actually take them down. But the interesting thing is what happens after they are taken down, right? What will fill the symbolic void of that particular space that was initially consecrated to a certain idea of how our nations were created. Um, and one particular example that I like a lot is the example of Mexico City. Uh, Mexico in general is not very pro-Hispanic in its um, historical memory. Um, they eradicated statues to the Spanish kings a long time ago. Mexico, in fact, had a large agrarian revolution in the 1910s. 
uh, period in which many of those statues fell. But for some reason, the Colombo statues have survived. So just very recently, the government of the city of Mexico took down the statue of Christopher Columbus. And in the last few years, it is the women's movement that has been quite a protagonist in the uh, relations between state and society. And basically it is women who took um, by the force of their presence, the roundabout where the Columbus statue used to be and put a statue of their own. Uh, is a silhouette of a woman with, uh, with the fist um, in uh, a position. And that is now known as the uh, runabout of the women who struggle. And the runabout of the women who struggle um, has the pretension of staying there. And of course, now there is an important debate in the city about what to actually do with that monument. In addition, the word monument in Spanish uh, is gendered. It is monumento, right? It's, it's a masculine word. So obviously when the, um, the new statue was placed there by the, uh, by the social movements, they called it monumenta. So it is a monumenta, it's a, it's a female monument, right? Um, uh, of um, women who struggle. So, I think that is a, is a very interesting um, uh, aspect. I have been in my work uh, most focused on truth commissions, but because of the work of truth commissions, which I will comment later, um, I have been involved in a number of places where uh, truth commissions challenge the way in which a society remembers itself. So places in Sri Lanka, for example, um, in the north of the island, where after the uh, military victory of the state at against the Tamil separatist movements, uh, most Tamil movements were removed forcibly and replaced by militaristic monuments. I have been very active in the last few years in Mali, in Northwest Africa, where um, I have seen how monuments erected from the state with the best of intentions, dedicated to uh, causes that are very worthy, like uh, Pan-African Union or uh, peace, are simply abandoned because they were imposed from the state in a very vertical way of uh, construction. And I think uh, that that has, has been at the basis of my own reflection on how uh, politics of memorialization are to be more effective. And I'm going to keep those reflections for my intervention uh, uh, when we go to the second question. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Um, I, I just want to point out one thing that you said that I found to be uh, really profound. You talked about how when memorials are taken down, something needs to fill that symbolic void. And we do know that communities hold on to memories um, through these memorials. And so the question about what replaces things that were problematic in the past is really critical to examine, so thank you. We'll now move on to Dr. Catherine Hall. Uh, Professor Hall, I welcome you to share your reflections as well. Well, thank you. It's been very, very interesting, um, inspiring to see the artistic work and the museum work, and then to think, as Eduardo has been talking about, the complexities of the politics of memorialization. And we've certainly been living with them in Britain um, for quite a long time now. So I'm speaking from, from the UK, from London, which has a very, very different history from the US. And so in a way, that's the first thing I need to say because I'm a historian. I've done lots of work sort of relevant to museums and with museums, but fundamentally I've done historical work which has been about challenging the national history as it's been told. And the national history in the UK has been a history of a benevolent empire, uh, which has brought uh, freedom and liberty to enslaved people in the Caribbean, in Africa, and so on. And the that story, which I suppose was first fundamentally challenged by the Trinidadian historian, 
Eric Williams in 1944 in his book Capitalism and Slavery, where he challenged that view of uh, abolition and emancipation and argued that it was primarily done for convenient economic reasons, not because people were so generous and humanitarian in their approaches. But that way of thinking really went uh, into decline for a very long time. Well, it, it was never accepted. But then at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, with the emergence of a significant population of African Caribbean descendants, the politics around slavery began to be opened up in a new way. And in 2007, at the time of the celebrations which were going on about the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade, people were asking questions very publicly about how to think about that abolition. Should we be thinking so much about abolition or should we be thinking about the 200 years of slavery that preceded it? So it's in that context that I was involved with a group in London at University College. And we started doing work to really find a way of challenging the picture that has been the predominant picture in Britain, which is that Britain had no direct involvement in slavery, that it all happened somewhere else, and therefore it's other people's problem, either in the US or in the Caribbean primarily. And it's very interesting that the way in which uh, slavery has been taught in schools in Britain for a long time, and how race has been taught, is that it's been taught as if it's to do with the US, it's not to do with here. So the whole, our work has been focused on bringing slavery and race home to Britain. Now, obviously, maybe one of the things you have seen in the news was that in the wake of George, Floyd, George Floyd's killing, uh, the um, statue of a slave trader and a slave owner in Bristol, Edward Colston, was forcibly removed. And that was after a very long and thrown into the, into the um, dock, which is where the slave, trips, slave ships used to come in in Bristol. But that happened after a very long debate within the city of Bristol as to what should happen to that statue, a debate which has continued after its removal and where there is no clear agreement, you know, there's no simple progressive position on this, that what should happen is that that statue should be dumped. Anyway, the background to this is that the reason how people knew about Edward Colston's activities uh, as a slave owner was in large part to do with the work that we did over a decade, which is now all publicly accessible. And it's called the Legacies of British Slave Ownership. It's, there's a, a database which uh, tells the uh, history of all the white Britons. They're not all actually, they're all white in Britain. There are quite a number of people of mixed race in the Caribbean, all the people who received compensation when slavery was abolished in 1834, because when slavery was abolished, the slave owners in Britain and parts of the empire were paid by the British government, by the British taxpayers for the loss of what was defined as their human property. So what we gathered was all the figures and all the people uh, who received compensation. And insofar as we could, we established, particularly for those in Britain, what they did with the money, what their politics were, what they invested in, what they wrote about, what their impact was on the society after emancipation. Because what does it mean to talk about the great gift of Britain's liberty when it was bought in that way, what was going on. So obviously there's lots more I could say about this, but perhaps that first crucial point to make is that we have had to establish, and by now lots of work has been done in Britain, 
but we've had to establish a shift in historical understanding, in historical consciousness, to make it clear that Britain has been deeply involved in what we would call the whole slavery business over a very, very long period and has benefited from it over generations. That's been our work and all the historical work that we have accumulated and published and so on is of course being used by museums, by galleries, by artists, by writers. It's become part of public debate and public discourse, but it is highly contested and we are in the middle of culture wars, which you will be only too familiar with from your different perspectives and the different places from which you're coming, which are going on all the time. So we're in a battle, uh, but some victories have been won in terms of shifts in historical consciousness. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall, for elaborating on all of that. And um, it is interesting to see the ways in which Britain is trying to come to some sort of understanding about the truth of its, its history as an empire and its connection to slavery specifically and the pushback against um, embracing the truth about that history as well. So thank you very much for speaking to that. I will now move on to uh, Dr. Tillett again. I have a question um, specifically about the work that you have done um, in terms of writing about the history of memorialization through the prism of art um, and the work of artists as well since the end of the civil rights movement. How have artists reclaimed sites of memory about the history of slavery in the United States? And what lessons do these artists teach us about reckoning with the past? Thank you. First of all, I just thank you again for this dynamic conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the subject of my first book. So I was I went off camera just so I could uh, get a show and tell here, Sites of Slavery. And the question that I was really interested in the, the dissertation that became the, the book was, you know, how after, you know, historically we, we know the, the record after slavery, there was this moment of uh, reconstruction and, and deep democratic optimism, and then comes the nadir and uh, segregation. And so I was really motivated by this idea of what happens when a people aren't allowed to mourn trauma um, and what happens when the the symbols and the the memories of, of, of violent oppression um, is kind of removed and and a sanitized uh, narrative of history is, is replaced. So that's like the, the big question I was interested in. And I was also a child in undergrad in the 90s. And so you would have a new novel, what we call neo-slave narratives uh, on slavery come out. So African-American writers were really, and not just African-American writers, but also Afro-Caribbean writers, um, there was a plethora of novels that were taking on slavery and really uh, non-conventional ways, right? First person narrator that would maybe moving back and forth in time, Beloved being the most obvious and uh, something like Kindred by uh, Tony Morrison's Beloved being the most obvious and most celebrated such text and something like Kindred that came about earlier by Octavia Butler being a kind of sci-fi. So that's the era in which I came to this, this question in the 90s with these new novels. And then when I went to grad school, then you take that and you're like, oh, it's everywhere. It's in dance and it's in um, theater. And it's also uh, the reparations movement, the early 2000s reparations movement was burgeoning as well. So that was the impulse behind my curiosity. And so there's a quote that I often, I, I end the book with, I think with Toni Morrison, and I want to situate us then. She says it's in 1989 and kind of where we are now. So she writes, and she's writing Beloved, as she, she says this in an interview. There is no place you and I can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presence of or recollect the absences of slaves. There is no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. There's not even a tree scored, an initial that I can visit or you can visit in Charleston or Savannah or New York or Providence or better still on the banks of the Mississippi. And because such a place doesn't exist, the book had to. 
And so I've been really motivated about what's the role of art when uh, there's you know art versus kind of like a state sanctioned amnesia, or what's the role of art as a place of trauma, uh, of rectifying or, or dealing with trauma, but also what's the role of art in this notion of rep just showed us or something like the Whitney uh, plantation or in UVA, the, the memorial to the enslaved laborers. So there's been a concerted effort, I think, in the last 15 to 20 years, building on the works of prior generations of activists and artists to really concretize what was always kind of circulating in the cultural memory or the collective memory, mainly of African-Americans to make them um, these really larger than life uh, uh, moments or memorials to remember slavery. Uh, the Whitney Plantation, I think, is really interesting as well because part of my research, I went on many different plantation tours, right? Um, and so, obviously, not only are they kind of sites of tourism and that kind of a nostalgia for a particular uh, Southern uh, landscape, um, but often at the expense of or the erasure of those whose ancestors of enslaved people. And so now there's an, a, a more slowly, I think a more integrated way of remembering and the Whitney Plantation in particular is one in which it's kind of centering enslaved people. But in my research, I had to literally leave the United States uh, to find um, uh, these, uh, to go to West Africa and to uh, places obviously like Senegal or to Ghana or to um, Benin to find these structures of the slave ports. And I write about what that means and what it means for African-Americans to return there to find a kind of moment in which there's a beginning of this narrative of slavery um, before one lands in the new world. And so again, it's in lieu of a monument, in lieu of a memorial that African-Americans and Afro-diasporic subjects in, in the quote unquote new world have had to return to West Africa in order to remember uh, slavery in the United States or, or to remember slavery in other parts of the Caribbean. So I think those tensions are things that I'm really interested in. But now I do think I'm both optimistic in a way about the, the work that's been done over the last decade, and also very aware of the ongoing backlash against that work. And I think that's something we should can talk about here, maybe in the Q&A, that um, one of the ways I ended my book was that with the ascent of Barack Obama, uh, now this seems uh, so long ago, but when he was president, there was the reemergence of Confederate balls. And there was a way in which there's both um, a recognition of slavery and uh, through Michelle Obama on one hand, right? And then you had the, the ascension of a complete backlash against uh, and a rewriting of history um, that now, as we saw with the rise of Trump has really taken over. So we have this paradox that continues to exist and we're in a ongoing crisis of memory, of amnesia and of uh, whose, whose histories are we gonna really celebrate and whose histories do we understand as part of the democratic story? Thank you so much, Dr. Tilla. Like you just said, um, we are in a crisis of memory. And I was struck by what you said about the connection between art and state-sanctioned amnesia. And so I want to turn now to Ms. Elliott to talk about state-sanctioned remembrance and the work that you're, you're, uh, you're doing 
um, at the Smithsonian. So why um, do you think that these types of memorialization efforts have been so critical to um, the work at the, the Smithsonian? And if you could also speak directly to the importance of architecture and physical spaces of memory, I'm mean, gonna expand on, on some of what you shared um, at the beginning of our conversation. Um, that would be wonderful, thank you. You are muted. Thank you, I was trying to be respectful so no one could hear me shuffling my papers. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try and be succinct, but let me just start with this. Um, before I started at the museum, I used to um, contract with different history and cultural organizations, one of which was the Humanities Council of Washington, DC. And um, at the time, this was around um, the early 2000s, um, we were dealing with um, the influx of the Main Streets projects um, supported by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which um, came into the DC area. And there were projects, primarily the first one in um, 14th Street, 14th and U Street, which is known as Historic Black Broadway. And then also in um, the H Street corridor and in other parts of the city, Shaw and other parts of the city. Um, suffice it to say today, um, the Historic Black Broadway was renamed in some sense by um, commercial folks who renamed it Mid-City. Why? Because part of that work started to impact the community through gentrification. And so that gentrification saw many of these buildings, historic buildings that were established by African-American men and women who created businesses, who built homes, who built churches, they started to either go away or have um, or be repurposed. And what was really frustrating was watching what I like to see, um, like to call um, historic headstones go up in their place. At one time, a black man lived here. At one time, there were some black people who sat on this corner and drank coffee. And so you get to read these labels, but you really got to get out of your car and read that label and be intentional and understand that that's what that panel is there for, right? So um, we used to use um, these convening sessions to talk with new and longstanding residents to talk about the importance of having these sites of memory, of history, of identity, of presence, particularly the presence of Black people, because otherwise it was being erased, right? So when you think about the work and going down to, um, to South Carolina, Edisto Island, where we acquired the slave cabin, what we found was that many of the property owners had bought these properties that were formerly plantations and there were slave cabins on those, plant, on those plantation sites, but people had to pay taxes on those extra buildings. So they would let them go to the wayside and fall apart and just be lost to the elements. Fortunately, we had put the word out that we were looking for a slave cabin and there were two that we understand that were left on Edisto Island and we were able to acquire the one of those last two cabins. Um, it was given to the Edisto Island Historic Preservation Society, which was comprised of at the time, an all white board. It was given to that organization by the descendants of the enslavers. The Edisto Historic Preservation Society said, we cannot um, conserve this object properly. And we know you're looking for a cabin and we think it is very important that this story be told in your museum. So we were really honored to be able to acquire that donation from um, the, it really came directly from the descendants of the enslavers, right? And then with that object coming into our possession and having to do the work to get it up to DC, it was so powerful to use just this object to really prompt meaningful, substantive, sometimes hard dialogue amongst descendants of the enslaved and descendants of the enslavers. And it was really powerful to just give people space to tell their truth and to learn from one another and to say, I didn't know that. And this makes me think about X and this makes me think about Y and that explains why this happened versus that, right? And so what was really important is the community started to understand why it was imperative to preserve these histories. And so to understand that and think about, here's this community 
mixed with interracially, intergenerationally, economically, who we identified that um, house, there was an opportunity to restore that Hutchinson house. And the family had owned it through all these generations, but they couldn't hold on to it any longer. And so one of the, the final um, heritage steward in that family decided to sell the home and the Edison Island Open Land Trust stepped in and was able to get a, um, a grant, purchase the home and create a model of, this is how you preserve that history. They partnered with the University of South Carolina and worked with their, um, their team that does um, architecture and um, preservation work. And they brought in students to help with that. They also worked with local professionals, local community members came in, black and white. And with each step along the way, it prompted dialogue about the history, about the landscape and why it is important to preserve a structure such as that Hutchinson house. And it is now being restored to be used as a site for education. So that's a whole other thing. What's the point of having this on the landscape? What are you gonna use it for, right? You don't just have it so someone can drive by and go, hey, look at that house. And so now there are waysides outside of that house and people are eventually going to be invited in to reflect on this history and learn about black men who were able to in reconstruction when land was being ripped away from them to be able to hold on to land and distribute it amongst the community members and use it to advance the race and use it to survive through a racist and segregated United States, right? Very, very important. Equally important is thinking about in Alabama. So in Alabama, you have a community that really speaks to the legacies of slavery. So you have these, these ancestors who were forced over. And again, in 1860, they survived those last five years of enslavement in the United States, but they built a thriving community. This is a model that is not unlike any, like these other black communities, historically black communities across the nation. What happens? Think about Freedmanstown in Houston, Texas. These communities are seen as less than, you know what, we need a new highway, just put it through there right? The same with Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? And so the funding that needs to come to preserve these sites, to understand this history, to support these communities that have been fighting the hard fight, right? Going through, as we say, segregation, racism, all of that, these legacies of slavery. And here you have this community. Again, it was thriving, but their businesses were lost, many of them. The, a highway was placed through that community. And we won't even talk about some of these other communities where burial grounds are destroyed, right? And so we have to bring that memory back and we have to make it very um, apparent and we have to be intentional about it. I'm very pleased to say that through our work, we were able to get the support, bipartisan support from Congress and the Senate to squarely place in the federal budget a $500,000 line item for what? Community engagement, education, and public programming focused on this history, right? And so to have that is extremely important. And the last thing I would say about that is in doing this work, and creating these sites and transforming the landscape, therefore transforming the community and the way we approach these stories of not just slavery, but slavery and freedom and black agency, black power, right? But in doing this work, it requires that you don't just talk to the descendants. You have to talk to the politicians, you have to talk to the funders, you have to talk to the grant organ granting organizations, you have to talk to the community leaders, you have to talk to the businesses. And so we are able to do this work and, and from that flows activities like we are going to be doing teacher training, which will come with certification through the University of South Alabama so that teachers can teach this history. And we'll be doing archeological projects with local students, um, including terrestrial archeological projects on the landscape. And so what's important about that is the businesses the tourism businesses, we propose that through the local land grant university, they create a certificate program in hospitality and tourism to allow young people to be certified so they can be part of these businesses and interpret their own landscape. Very, very important. How does all of this come full circle? We don't do history just for the sake of doing history. It's to empower people. And so that's some of what we do. And the last thing I'll say is 
to um, Dr. Hall's point about this um, history being challenged. Um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture has a new feature called the Searchable Museum, a digital feature, and we knew exactly what you were talking about, that that is the case. So we created a space called How We Know What We Know so that we can pull back the, the veil and show people transparently, this is how we do our work, through archaeology, genealogy, oral history, archival work, through um, through um, databases such as the one that you have created, Dr. Hall, and more so that we can show people this is what it takes to bring this history to life and to show people the primary sources that we use and how we gather all this information to create transformative experiences. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Elliott. I think that in our current socio-political climate, not just here in the United States, but around the world, it's, it's critical that these efforts are taking place where tangible attempts are being made for people to have civil discourse around the truth about history. And so the work that you are doing really speaks to that. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, our next question is for uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Eduardo, um, I've, I've long followed your work because um, I, I do research on truth commissions. Um, so I would like you to speak a little bit about what we can all learn from the efforts of truth commissions globally as it relates to racial reckoning that is needed here in the United States and also elsewhere um, in the world. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, I like the question a lot because in the US, my experience is that this discourse of exceptionality is not just a discourse that is practiced in the political spheres, but is uh, very deep in the culture. So there is um, some sort of skepticism about what can be learned from experiences in other countries. And so, um, you know, the experience of truth commissions around the world, for example, is something that, that can be traced back to the 1980s. And in the US is just happening quite recently. And uh, suddenly there is all this interest. And it, it tells me that there is a lot to learn actually, and that it would be very useful for the US uh, to try to establish those connections. I'm thinking particularly, for example, of diasporic knowledge and the important exchange that can happen uh, between um, uh, racial healing, racial reckoning initiatives in the US and the experience of truth commissions in Africa. Um, I am thinking of the enormous uh, wealth of knowledge that is being accumulated in indigenous truth commissions around the world uh, that is a wealth of experience out there. The Truth Commission of South Africa was directly inspired by the Truth Commission in Chile. And the Truth Commission of Peru was directly inspired by the Truth Commission of South Africa and so on and so forth. So there is a task there. The first thing we need to understand is that Truth Commissions were established typically after authoritarian uh, processes, after dictatorships or after armed conflict. And that is why they had the, the shape that they had. They were um, institutions that were created on the assumption that they happened after a period of exception and that they addressed an exceptional moment, something that was not repeatable. And that in fact, one of the tasks of the commission was to avoid its repetition. They were uh, commissions focused on individual human rights violations, violations suffered by specific individuals, right? And, um, and since it was assumed that they happened in the moment of a political transition, uh, truth commissions resolved their findings in certain policy recommendations, things that you do because the exceptional period has ended. But the problem with racial reckoning and racial justice is that of course it's structural and the situation of injustice is, is continuous. So we are not talking here about a post-conflict or a post-authoritarian regime. We are talking about the continuity of the same political structures. And so to put the example of indigenous peoples, for example, you may have a situation like, I don't know, Canada, 
where uh, there has not been an internal armed conflict, there has not been a coup d'etat or a military government, and yet for the indigenous peoples whose children were kidnapped by the Canadian state to take to the Indian residential schools and to forcibly assimilate them to the majority, the experience of colonialism is completely comparable to an experience of an authoritarian military regime. Um, so what can we learn of the fact that uh, these commissions have taken place even considering the uh, significant structural differences uh, between the different um, aspects, the objects of the research? I think there are a couple of lessons. One is that commissions have been very characteristic in unleashing the power of voice in a way that uh, criminal trials don't. The US is obsessed by criminal trials. It's obsessed about prosecutions. In fact, I think it is even a form of popular entertainment. You have TV shows dedicated to trials, movies dedicated to trials, right? And the trial is considered an entertaining combat between the defense and the prosecution, in which, of course, the center is the accused. It's never the victim. The victim is there as an incidental presence which depends on the strategy of the prosecution. The victim may or may not be uh, used in its voice in the trial. A truth commission is exactly the opposite. A truth commission is articulated around the voice of the victim. And that to me is the big difference. It is not focused on the standards of evidence needed in a trial because the consequence of a trial is the punishment or not of a given person. It is focused on the voice and the experience that will be legitimated, that will be recognized. And that is the important thing. Um, and so the first lesson to me is how to unleash that power, the power of the first person testimony and how to create um, in truth commissions spaces that are safer and that are more respectful and more empathetic than the traditional uh, justice apparatus. I think that truth commissions need to completely depart from the, um, any kind of similarity to the judicial process. And the second lesson learned for me, and this is where I promise I finish, is that truth commissions work better when they um, are the result of a social movement. That is, when truth commissions are established from above, as an agreement between political elites after a peace agreement, for example, and are installed as some sort of gracious concession from the state, right? Uh, well, they may work, but the problem is that after the Truth Commission is over, you don't have any stakeholders who are ready to carry the message of the commission. And I think um, what has worked better is when truth commissions are the organic result of a movement that is demanding the end of impunity and is demanding transformation. And I think that is what could be so significant about experiences in the US. The first uh, truth commission that people usually refer to as the first in the US, the Greensboro, North Carolina Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a result of a strong accumulation of experiences, study, alliances, and leadership. And it may be interesting for you guys to, to know that um, my organization, together with some other colleagues, we have mapped around 60 um, initiatives across the country, some of which are called truth commissions. There is a truth and reconciliation commission established by the legislature of Maryland. There is a truth commission established by the governor of California. There is a truth commission in the city of Iowa City uh, that we have been involved with directly there is a project for a truth commission in Maine. Um, so, you know, I do think that the commissions that are going to work are those that come from the grassroots, where you have a convergence of social movement and political will, which typically is going to happen easier, I think, in the local sphere. There are also projects of truth commissions at the national level, um, in the House and in the Senate, and in spite of all the uh, endorsements that, that, that they may get, uh, it is very unlikely that they're going to be created. So strategically, I think it is very important to focus 
on what is happening at the local level, because that is where there is more of a likelihood that the convergence of political will and social movement is going to happen. So those are the two lessons learned that I think may be relevant. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez, for providing all that insight on truth telling processes and the work of truth commissions. We can learn a lot from that. Our last question um, is for you, Dr. Hall. Uh, what are some of the key connections between the US and the United Kingdom's colonial and slavery footprint, which are critical for policymakers and practitioners to understand in order to do more effective work? Well, I think what I want to say first um, is that I think each of us in different ways is talking about the different kinds of reparatory work that we can do. So we've heard about uh, the artistic work um, that sounds, you know, really wonderful and amazing. And of course, there are lots and lots of artists working in Britain in the same way. I mean, the the uh the kind of temporality that Dr. Tillett was talking about is very much the same here, that for the last 15 years, an awful lot has been going on, um, both in uh, writing, in fiction, in um, visual culture, uh, in popular television even, uh, and so on, um, and in museums. But we have no nothing equivalent, of course, to the Smithsonian. So, you know, the African American Museum is a very, very special and very wonderful place and uh, marvelous that that kind of um, funding has been available to do that work. I mean, it's it's a resource for all of us, not just for, um, for the US. And certainly, you know, my visits there have been really wonderfully eye-opening. So, but I think what I'm committed to doing is writing reparatory history, which is just another version of what everyone else is doing. We're not going to have a truth commission in, there's no way of having a truth commission in the UK because nobody thinks the victims are here. You know, they're somewhere else. Um, and... I mean, if we were to start a truth commission for the British Empire here, can you imagine? I mean, every other country, every country of the British Empire has suffered from racisms of different kinds of appalling forms of exploitation. You know, so the problem of raising the question of reparation here is very, very difficult because it's totally overwhelming, actually. I mean, the scale of what the British Empire did is just horrific. And of course, they had plenty of collaborators in all the places that they colonized. But nevertheless, Britain itself carries, in my view, tremendous political responsibility. And we as the beneficiaries, we as the contemporary beneficiaries of Britain's wealth, which has been built on the back of the debt which is owed to all these other countries, you know, slavery is only one, the particular forms of Caribbean slavery are only one of the issues that we face, completely different set of issues to be faced in relation to the Indian Empire. But, you know, the now, the unfortunately, we're facing not just uh, black racism, but of course, a uh, very significant um, uh, anti-Islamic feeling in, in the UK, which has grown exponentially in these last years, and tensions between different communities and so on. So, you know, it's a very, very complicated history. But for me, the work is to look at the specificities of the history uh, that I can discover. And I think, I mean, you started asking a question about the relation between Britain and the US and how to think about those two places. They're so different, the histories are so different, but the US is so powerful and 
you know, the ways the ways of thinking in the U.S. about race are so powerful that one of the things we have to do here is insist also on our difference and on the specificity of our history, which is not a history of plantation history, of uh, plantation society in this culture. As I said at the beginning, it's all happened somewhere else. So it's how you deal with that gap. And the first gap that you have to deal with is the gap that you know British history has been told as if it's an island story. That has been the classical way of telling the history of England. You know, it's not even called Britain, it's called England. And that history is about the island. But of course, actually, it's a history of empire. And it's a history of empire that started with the colonization of Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and then expanded out into the, all the other places that expanded out into. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, the truth telling, the bit of truth telling that I and people like me can do is to write history, to make television programs, to lecture, to talk, to do community group work, to help museums with what they're doing, but fundamentally to be involved in the business of rewriting history and trying, you know, I don't think there is one truth. I really don't. <laughs> but I think we try and elaborate the truth as best we can. And that's the work we have to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. And on that note, um, I, I want to thank all of our panelists for your insights and for everything that you have shared with us today. Uh, Dr. Hall, the, the final point you made about all of us being involved in this work of truth telling is a very nice way to sum up what we've been trying to do in our panel today, that we can all be involved in understanding that there are different types of truth. Truth is multi-layered. Um, those who have historically told their stories or have been able to tell their stories are often those who have held the economic and political power. And mm -hmm. this is the time that we can all have our stories told and we can all work towards making sure that um, we have a more honest understanding of the truth of our societies. So again, I want to thank you all for spending time with us. And um, this has been an, an, a really wonderful and insightful conversation. Thank you to each of our panelists again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria and all, all, and all of the panelists. What an amazing session. Um, and now I'm very excited. I'm Carrie Ratcliffe, a research fellow here at the IRA Project. And we're very excited and appreciative to have a remarkable performer joining us today to share her extraordinary talents and passion for social justice. Gather your friends, family, and colleagues, turn up your volume and have a listen. This is gonna be really remarkable. Ray Zaragoza is an award-winning singer songwriter who NPR Music called one of the most fresh and compelling voices in folk music today. She has independently released two albums, Fight For You and Women In Color. She's performed with the United Nations. The TED Conference has opened for bands such as Dispatch, Rodriguez, and Rising Appalachia. She's also one of the songwriters for a new Netflix animated show, Spirit Rangers, where she's written more than 45 songs in the last two years for this show. Ray, with her mesmerizing voice, inspired lyrics, and soulful melodies, tells stories worth listening to. And we encourage you to download her music, visit her website, or support her talents at her Patreon site. All of these details will be put in the chat in the next session. Um, Ray will join us for two musical sessions, the first lasting about 25 minutes. And then after our incredible lunch speaker, Alvin Warren, she'll return for a 10 minute interlude. You don't wanna miss any of what's coming up. Click on the next session and we'll be there. <laughs>